morning, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, my name is Chase, if you did not know that. And we're just going to jump right in. I got uh, for you today, uh, I want to give you something. I want to give you what I like to call whiteboard wisdom. What is whiteboard wisdom, you might be wondering. Um, it's pretty simple. It's wisdom that I write on a whiteboard, man. You guys are... You guys, don't tell them, but you are smarter than first service, okay? So <laughs> whiteboard wisdom. No, I, there's, there's a couple reasons why I like to think through wisdom, specific whiteboard wisdom in my life. I just call it this because I, I think of short, simple wisdom that you can quickly write down and easily write down on a whiteboard. So just a few words um, that, that I think are important. And, and what I want to give you is a, a little bit of this short, simple, sweet uh, thoughts of wisdom. And it's not wisdom just because I say it. Um, although I would like to think that I have some wisdom in me, but it's not wisdom because I say it. It's not even just wisdom because it comes from the Bible, although it is in the Bible and, and the Bible is full of wisdom. But specifically, we're looking at this book called Ecclesiastes, which is a strange, um, odd, unique, yet I would say beautiful book that actually the Bible classifies as uh, wisdom literature. Ooh, fancy. There's a few books in the Bible that they would say, these are books that, that we would call wisdom literature, important books that you can get some wisdom from. And think of like Proverbs. Proverbs is all about wisdom. Ecclesiastes is the same, although Ecclesiastes is kind of unique. If you've been with us the last few weeks, he has a unique way of giving us wisdom, a unique way of helping us have a better life. And so what I believe today is, I believe today is we're going to look at just a few verses from chapter 7, and we're going to walk through these short, simple thoughts of wisdom that he lays out in a unique way, and we're just going to tackle them together. And I believe that it'll help you have not just a better life, but a, a wiser life. And not just a, a better life, but a godly life, a life that I believe helps you look more like Jesus. And you hear me say it all the time that, that a life where you follow after Jesus, it's simple but not easy. And that's what I think you'll discover today as we look at some of the stuff he says, you're going to say, well, that seems really simple, but to actually walk it out and live it out, it's not always very easy. But I really believe that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. It's a simple life, follow after the life and teaching of Jesus, but sometimes it's not very easy. So to get us all on the same page, to help us kind of see what we're getting ourselves into, I want to start with a few questions. How many of you love taking tests? Good. Oh, all right. Yeah, there's always one. Uh, there's always one. Um, I want to give you a simple quiz today, just four questions, true or false. So, I mean, this is the kind of test you want to take because you might get it wrong, but you might just get it right, okay? So here we go, four questions to help us all get on the same page, true or false. Um, I'll ask the question, then I'll ask you to raise your hand if it's true or raise your hand if it's false, and there will be half of you that don't want to raise your hand because you don't like class participation, but it's okay. It's just a simple test. Here we go. First, true or false? There. Is that better? If it's not, I don't, I don't care. Anyway, true or false? I like laughing better than crying. Raise your hand if that's true for you. You like to laugh more than you like to cry. All right, hands down. Raise your hand if that's false. You love crying. I knew there was one. I knew there was, I know where she was going to sit. I knew there was one, right? There's a few of you, okay? All right, all right. Number two, I like parties better than funerals. Raise your hand if that's true in your life. You'd rather go to a party then go to a funeral. All right. Hands up if that's false. You would rather go to a funeral than a party. Yeah, uh, just don't forget that we have teenagers in the room and they're just going to always say the opposite of what they know and believe. That's okay. All right. I like it. It's good. Just a few of you. Number three, thinking or talking about my birthday is better than thinking or talking about the day that I will die. Raise your hand if that's like true in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We're losing people now. We're getting too many questions. Raise your hand if that's false. You'd rather think and talk about, oh, okay. All right, interesting. A lot more hands popped up to that one. Okay. Um, number four, last but not least, I like compliments better than criticism. Raise your hand if that is true in your life. Please tell me how much you like me. Okay, compliment me. All right, put your hands down. Raise your hand if that's false in your life. You'd rather be critiqued than praised. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. They allowed me to have the microphone today, so hang on, hang on. That's my fault. All right, so let me just say this. If at any point during the questions you truthfully and honestly answered false, then let me just tell you that Solomon would say you might have some wisdom in you. 
you might have a little bit of wisdom. If you're like me and all of us that were more truthful than not, and we said true to almost all of these, Solomon would say, you should listen to the sermon today. <laughs> because what he's about to tell us is this unique way of helping us understand some wisdom that I would say doesn't come natural. Because I would say for most of us, the natural answer is no, true, 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 true. And what Solomon's going to say is he's going to find a way to teach us some things by telling us that this can be false, 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 false. So let's get back to a little bit of whiteboard wisdom. We're going to walk through chapter 7 where he lays out these short, simple, one or two lines of wisdom for us today. We'll start with verse number 1. It says, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume, and the day you die is better than the day you are born. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. Here's the first piece of whiteboard wisdom. I'll write it this way. I just wanted to say it a little bit differently. I would say um, a good name... A good name matters. Now, Chase is a good name, but that, that's not what I mean. Okay, a good name matters. A good name matters. What do people think when they hear your name? What is the reputation that you have? What do people think about when they hear you come up, when they see you walk into the room? What is the kind of reputation they have? Do you have a good name? Do you have a good reputation? Solomon says a good reputation is better or more valuable than expensive perfume. Now, perfume may not mean that much to you, although someone in the first service sent me this picture, I really wish I could have put it up on the screen, of this closet, I mean closet, with multiple shelves, four or five shelves, full of perfume. Like, it's incredible. And he says, I might have a problem but I'm working on it. So to him, perfume means a lot. To most of us, we're not like, wow, I love expensive perfume. But expensive perfume was pretty important and is pretty important to a few categories of people. One, teenage boys, okay? Eh, it's funny in my head, okay? But also probably to the people that Solomon is writing to, to in his time and day because back in that day, they didn't have the opportunity to shower as much as we have the opportunity to. Um, they also didn't have deodorant, and they didn't spend a lot of times like sitting in air conditioning. They spent a lot of times being active and walking and getting dirty. And so I, I'm guessing, although I haven't ever been there in their time period, I'm guessing they didn't always smell good. And so a good perfume in his day, an expensive perfume is one, the more expensive it was, the longer it would last and the better it would cover the stench. So what I started to think through, that what kind of came to my mind is it almost is like Solomon is saying, it's better to smell bad, but people think well of you than to smell good and people don't want to be around you. It, it's better to not smell so good, but people think well of you than to smell bad, but people still don't want to be around you. It, it's better to have a good reputation. It's better to have good character. And most of us probably don't focus so much on our smell but I would guess so many of us focus a lot on our attention or our, our attention on our external appearance more than our internal character. I think a lot of us spend more time worrying about what we look like on the outside than how we act on the inside. We care more about our image than our reputation, and we care more uh, about our looks than maybe the legacy that we're going to leave. And we don't just do this for ourselves. We, we judge other people this way. We judge them by their outer appearance more often than the kind of person that they are. And, and I would say that Solomon would want us to know, hey, if you want some wisdom for your life, wisdom says that a good name matters, a good reputation matters. He adds to that in the same, uh, in the same vein. He's saying the, uh, uh, the day you die is better than the day you're born. And what I think he's trying to help us understand is that if we think more about how we'll be remembered when we die, we'll probably focus more on what matters the most while we're still living. We'll probably focus more on the important things while we're still alive if we think about how we're going to be remembered the day we die. I know you've probably heard this before, but what will people say about you at your funeral? Whenever you go to a funeral, people have all these great things to say, but what, what would they say about you? What is the kind of reputation or the legacy that you're working to leave? A, a good name matters. This is important. But but I want you to understand, this is not about becoming a people pleaser. 
or, or, or living for the approval of others, I don't think Solomon would tell us that that's a good thing. I struggle with that. I've, I've said it before. One of my greatest desires is to be liked by all of you and loved by all of you. I want you all to think that, I'm, that you like me, <laughs> like we're family. And that's a problem in my life. I'm, I'm try, I, I am always trying to work on not always pleasing people or, or living for the approval of people, but to please God. So I don't think he's trying to say that we need to be people pleasers, but he's saying a good reputation, a good character is an important thing for you to have. We're called to live to please God and to love God, and part of pleasing God and loving God is treating people who are made in God's image well. How you treat other people, what they think of you, not, not do they think you're cool, but, but do they think you have good character? Do you bring positivity into their life? Are, are you a godly person for them to be around? That matters. Loving people well is a part of loving God. Jesus actually said the mark of a follower of, of him, he says they'll know you by your love for one another. The way that you love people will tell people who you follow. I think that's kind of important. In Proverbs chapter 22, uh, this is wisdom, another wisdom literature. It says, choose a good reputation over great riches. Or being... Because being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. I, I, you cannot always control how much wealth you have. Now, I know you can work hard and, and you can invest wisely and you can save diligently and you can, you can spend in a smart way. Those things are good and fine, but he says more important than that, more important than gaining treasure and riches and money, more important than that is a good reputation. So if you had to choose one, make sure that you choose a good name. Choose something that matters. I don't want to be known for my external appearance or even my wealth, but what matters more is a good name, more than perfume, more than wealth, more than riches. A good reputation is valuable. So we should chew on this piece of wisdom. How will people remember me and remember my name? What do people think about me when they hear my name? Solomon goes on to share this next piece of wisdom that most of us disagreed with at the beginning of our little true and false test we took. Verse number two, he says, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. Hmm. So the living should take this to heart. Here's some whiteboard wisdom for you. I'm sure you're really excited to be here today. Um, everybody dies. Thank you for coming to River's Edge today. I feel so encouraged. Everybody dies. It might be a little morbid, to be honest, but he's saying it's better to hang out at funerals than to go to a party. And I know we know this. We know that every one of us will die. But the question that I started wrestling with is, does this guide your life? Does this piece of wisdom impact the way that you actually live? The fact that life is short and tomorrow's not promised, does that impact how you live today? Maybe you've heard this question before. If you had one week to live, would you live differently? I, I bet we would. I bet we'd forgive quicker, love harder. We'd be mindful of how we spend our time. We'd enjoy the little things maybe more. I bet we'd find ways to live differently. And I think what Solomon is trying to say is that the living need to remember that life is a gift and that death comes to all. The living should take this to heart. Real quick, one more question. If you're living, would you raise your hand today? Just want to see <laughs> half of you. Okay, good. The other half are like me. If I was sitting where you were, I hate raising my hand when someone tells me to raise my hand. And yet, every time I preach, I find a way to do it. I don't know how to do it. If you're alive, then you should take this to heart that everyone will one day die. Don't waste your life. See, the reality of our death, and I believe what comes after our death, should cause us to live our lives with more purpose and intentionality, specifically followers of Jesus. Specifically, if, if you claim to be a Christian, if you put your faith in Christ, we need to live in light of eternity. That this life we're currently in will not last forever. Every one of us will die in this life. But we know the truth that the next life is forever. And the decisions that we make in this life impact the life we'll have forever. If we put our faith in Christ, believe that he came and died and rose again for our sins and call out to him as the Lord and leader of our life, then we get to spend eternity forever with God in the presence of God in heaven. How we live here matters. 
And I believe if we as followers of Jesus, if we, if we would just let this sink in, take this wisdom that everyone dies and what comes next depends on what you do now, then I think we would live differently. I think we would be more bold in telling people more about Jesus. I think we would care more about people's eternal destiny than our own personal comfort. I mean, think about it this way. How many people in your circle of influence have never heard you talk about Jesus? I mean, never. Think about that. How many people that you know that don't know Jesus have never actually heard you talk about him? So I think if, if we live with this in our mind, we would live a little bit differently. Life is a gift, but, but so is heaven, and there's so many people that, that haven't received the gift of heaven yet, and we know the truth, and yet we're too often, too often we're too timid to tell it. As I was thinking about this, I remember there's this book my wife read like maybe 10 years ago, and it was called One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven, and that's tell other people about Jesus. It's too late. It's too late to tell them the good news that Jesus came and died and rose again to save them from their sins. Once you're gone, it's too late for you to tell them. Now, maybe you'll have a great funeral, and, and the, the pastor will get up and preach the gospel, and, and because of the life you live, and, 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 and when you die, the people that are there, maybe they'll be impacted by it, but you can no longer tell someone about the good news of Jesus once you're gone. That's one thing you can't do in heaven. I always found that just an interesting thought process. I, I know that death is reality, and, and I don't think that we should ignore it. Eternity is real, and I don't think we should be unprepared for it. And I don't think that we should be afraid to talk about it because one day everyone will die. So he goes from death to sadness. So it's getting better. You ready for the next piece of wisdom? It's going to put a smile on your face. Let's see what he's got for us next. Sorrow is better than laughter for sadness has a refining influence on us. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you so much. First, you're reminding me that I will one day die, and then you're telling me that sadness is better than laughter. I don't know uh, if you wanted to hear this or not, but I don't like to cry. It's not, my, it's not my jam. I know there's a few of you that you heard the word cry, and you go, oh, I love a good cry. <laughs> That's not me. I'm not a fan of sorrow. I actually love laughter, and I love making other people laugh. Like, I, I think maybe that's one of the reasons I was put on this planet. Hopefully, to, one reason is to tell people about Jesus, but maybe right next to it, I, I really believe that for whatever reason, God created my family to be a little odd and to help people laugh. Most of the time, they're laughing at us, um, or they laugh after we said, hey, that should have been funny, and it wasn't funny, and then we feel weird about it. Like right now. <laughs> See, it always gets them. But I just, I really enjoy laughter. And I don't think he's saying laughter is bad. I don't think he's saying that joy is not good. But there is something interesting that he's trying to help us understand is that sadness has a refining influence on us. So I thought of it this way. And I would say this. I would say sadness, and I'm, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it different than my notes say. I'm going to say sadness can be Oops, here you go, a teacher. One of the most humbling and insecure things you can do is write on a whiteboard in front of everybody when you're not sure how to spell words. <laughs> and you're not sure if your handwriting is sloppy or not yet. So sadness can be a teacher. Sorrow can have a refining influence on us. I'm, I'm a sports guy, I played sports my whole life, all the way, even through college. And I think every coach that I can remember has always said the same thing, that you learn more from losing than you do from winning. You learn more from a loss, as painful and as tough as it is, you learn more when you lose than when you win. And the truth is, I think difficult situations in our life tend to have ways of teaching us and refining us and growing us that sad doesn't always mean bad. I'm not saying it's all the time, every sad and difficult situation, just learn the lesson. But oftentimes, sadness has a way of having an influence on us, a refining influence on us. Trials and testing can produce something positive in our life. Romans 5, 3 says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop 
endurance. There's something that trials and troubles and problems has, has a way of working its way in our life and bringing and producing something positive, helping us develop endurance. And it goes on to say, helping us develop character. We don't have to enjoy the sorrows and trials and problems, but we can grow through them. They can produce something in us. Sadness can be a teacher. I would guess most of us have situations in our life that we can look back at now and we can say, I did not like it. I wish I didn't have to go through it and I wouldn't want anybody else to walk through that. But I did learn something or I did grow or there's, this, there's at least this little positive thing that came out of that really negative situation. Not all of our negative situations have that, but there, there are lessons that we can learn. There is the ability for sorrow and sadness to, to have a refining influence on us. 2 Corinthians 4 says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the problems we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things we cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And the reason I share this is I want to remind us two quick things. One, our current troubles will not last forever. They might linger, they might be with us for a long time, but they will not last forever. And there are some things that we go through that we don't see the why and we don't know the reason and we cannot tell you the lesson that we've been learning. We can't look back yet and say, I've learned this from that difficult situation. There are some things in our life that we cannot, I believe, even in this life, learn the why. But the one thing we can always do in trials and troubles is look to what we cannot see. We can always fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. We can always look to Jesus and look to the future. We can always cry out to God during our difficulties. We may not like what we're going through and we may never know why we had to walk through that, but we can always trust the God who can walk through it with us. He's trustworthy even in the difficult situations. Oftentimes, sadness is a better teacher than laughter. It has a way to refine us and grow us and teach us something, even if the only thing that we know we're learning is that we can lean on God more. So he goes from death to sadness, and I don't like sadness. I, I want to move on, but, but this one, this one's tough for a people pleaser like myself. He says this in verse 5, better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be crave, praised by a fool. I'll say it this way. Although it's hard for us to truly comprehend this all the time, critique is it's good. Critique is actually a good thing. Every one of us, minus a few of you, raised your hand and says, I would rather be praised and complimented. We love it when people tell us how good we did at something. We love it when people tell us how good we could be, how much potential we have. We love compliments. We love praise. I love my kids because they see me as someone who's really awesome. I have fooled them so well. My son comes up to me sometimes and goes, man, dad, those muscles are huge. And I go, I know. I know. He has no idea how small my arms are, but he thinks I'm super strong. And I just let him keep thinking it. He, he knows how to, to encourage and praise me. I love that. All of us love that. To be complimented, thank you so much. But to be crit critiqued, for criticism to come, it's not always an easy thing for us. And I would say encouragement is good and godly, and it's something that we should be giving to others and something that we need in our life. All throughout scripture, you see the importance of, of using our words to build up, not tear down, of speaking things into the other people's lives that benefit those that listen. Like that's, that's biblical stuff. That's good and godly. And we need to be giving encouragement and praise to people. We need to be receiving encouragement in our life. He's not saying it's not good, he's saying that sometimes it's better to be critiqued. And it's actually better to be critiqued by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. The key to critique, I think in our life, the key to this wisdom is who is doing the critiquing. Critique by a wise person, criticized by a wise person is better. It's better than praise from a fool. He, he says this in Proverbs 27, it says it this way, wounds from a sincere friend are better than the many kisses of an enemy. 
Wounds from a sincere friend, someone that cares about you and, and loves you and wants what's best for you. Being, being wounded a little bit by them, it's better than being kissed from an enemy. One of the translations I always remember of is faithful are the wounds of a friend. They're faithful. There's something you, you can believe in, you can trust in. And that's why you need healthy people around you that at times have to be tough with you and tell you the thing that you don't want to hear but you need to hear. And these are specific, sincere friends, specific people that you care about, the critique they're bringing. They're wise and trusted in your life. The ooh matters. I got this great wisdom from Instagram somewhere. It's always a great source of <clears throat> wisdom. Maybe not, but take it for what it's worth. Don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. Interesting. If you wouldn't go to that person to get some advice about a situation, then maybe you don't need to be hearing the criticism and the critique that they're trying to offer you. Not everyone that wants to critique you in your life is worth listening to. I was being honest. Some people are fools. But the wise people, the sincere friends, you can trust what they have to say. You, there, there should be people in your life that can tell you, hey, this could have been better. You, you might need to work on this. It's not always easy hearing that. In our church and our staff, we've, we've developed a, um, uh, a culture of criticism, and we call it a culture of critique. And, and for years now, what we've tried to do is we've tried to get feedback on how we do things on Sunday morning. So on Monday morning, we sit and we talk about what went good and what could have done better. Specifically, we talk about the message that was preached. And it's not easy to sit in a circle with people when they start to tell you that, hey, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> or, hey, you could have done this a little bit differently or a little bit better. Or, I'm not sure why you, but I think it's healthy because I trust the people in that circle. I wouldn't say they're all wise, but I, <laughs> I trust them all. That's a joke. They're extremely wise. Our staff is amazing. And I trust them, and I know that they want what's best for me, and I know that they want what's best for this church, and I know that they care about the people that are hearing what is being said, so I can trust what they have to say. And sometimes getting critique from other people helps us see situations from someone else's perspective. And I really believe that that's a good thing. If you can trust the person giving critique, then you need to hear it and learn something from it. If you don't trust them, let it roll in here, one in here. Amen. Amen. When you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit helps you say it, you know? <laughs> uh, never mind. Every time I mess up talking, I'm like, man, I am really bad at my job. <laughs> I talk most of the time and I still don't get a sentence right. Uh, I even was reading it. If you don't trust the person giving the critique, let it roll right out. Oh, I wrote it wrong. That's why. Let it roll right in one ear and out the other. You get what I'm talking about? You know where I'm going? You fill in the blanks and you'll do a great job. Critique from the right person is good. Are you still okay? You up for a couple more? Yeah. All right, a couple more. Here we go. A couple more. These are going to go rapid fire because he just kind of like, bam, bam. He just kind of throws it out there to us. The next one says, finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. If, if I were to write it, I would say it this way, that patience, oh man, this is the word that's hard for me to remember how to spell. All right. Remember, it's just because you're watching me. Patience is godly. That's how I would say it. Patience is, is godly. It's not something that comes natural to all of us, but it is something that is godly. It's something that if you put your faith in Christ, it says the Holy Spirit lives within you, and it produces something in you. And in Galatians, it says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is this, love, joy, peace. Oh, patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience. It's something that we don't have to like, I can be patient, I can be patient, I can be patient, I can be patient, just try harder. No, it's something that we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us. The Holy Spirit lives in us and can produce within us patience that we just need to learn how to let out in our life. It's godly characteristic is patience. The ability to be able to wait, to be able to push through to the finish, to endure, this is a godly thing. Waiting is not easy. Whether you're waiting on God to answer or to come through or you're waiting on a situation to come to light or a situation to be done with, or maybe you've had to wait on a per person for one reason or another. Patience, it says, is better. Patience is important. Enduring to the end, finishing, it's better than starting. And we can seek God's help for patience, and we can ask the Holy Spirit 
to produce it in our life. Patience is a, is a godly thing. The very next verse, he says this. This, is, this might be my favorite one. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. If patience is godly, then anger is foolish. Oh, but don't want to... Oh, man. The more I have to write, the sloppier I get. Anger is foolish. I mean, he's pretty direct here. He says, you need to control your anger because if you don't, you'll look like a fool. You'll, you'll, look, you'll look foolish. I don't know how, how much more we should chew on this, but most of the time when we see someone get angry, most of the time they, they don't look very wise. Now, there is such thing as righteous anger, when we have, we're angry about the things that hurt God or the things that, that God is angry about, there's righteous anger that we can have. We see that in the Bible when, when God is telling Moses who he is, he says, my name is Yahweh, Yahweh. And he begins to talk about all these great things about he's compassionate, gracious, loving God. But he says, abounding in love and faithfulness, but he says he's slow to anger. So God does get angry, but he's slow to get there. So if we want to be like, God, we can get angry about the things that God is ang gets angry about, but we need to be slow to get angry. Our, our temper should not control us. We should be able to control our temper. And the majority of times that I, I, I believe, the majority of times most people let their anger control them, it's not righteous anger. It's foolish. James 1 says, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, for human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. I have struggled in my past with anger. It's been, been many years, but I used to get, I was very quick to anger, quick to speak, love to argue. I could fight with my words. I remember my muscles are not that big. <laughs> Gideon thinks I'm still a fighter, but let's be honest. I used to struggle with that. And, and over the years, God has really done a work in my life. And, and I have learned to control my temper. And, and one of the things I would just give you a little bit of advice, if, if you're, you're like that and you've been through that, just from someone that has struggled with that in their past, one thing that I've learned to do is I have learned when I, when I feel the anger within, when I feel my temper starts to want to come out. Oftentimes when I'm in a conversation with someone, I don't love what's happening or what they're saying. I can feel it. You know what I'm saying? Only the angry people know what I'm saying. What I have learned to do is, is to practice this. I've learned to slow down my speech. And I don't know if it'll work for you, but it's worked for me where I, where I learned to just take a deep breath and I, I slow down what I'm thinking, like, like slow down how I process it. And then when I begin to speak, I slow down my words. I learn to control my tone and I normally turn the volume down. Sometimes my wife thinks I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> and I've had to tell her that no, this is on purpose to help me make sure that I don't lash out, that I can keep my anger under control. I have never seen an argument or disagreement be solved faster by yelling at one another. I've never seen name calling or raising your voice make an argument better. I've just never seen that. So I had to learn to be slow to speak and slow to get angry because anger is foolish. It makes you look like a fool. All right, one more. You ready? One more. Verse number 10. Don't long for the good old days. <laughs> this is not wise. He's like, I could say what would be better, but instead I'll say this is not wise. <laughs> Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. And to wrap things up, I thought about just saying it this way. I'll just say it this. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. I kept this one in there because I thought it was just interesting how he wrote it. And I know there's so many people in life that are always living in the past and therefore I think are missing out on living in the present. There's a lot of good things that happened in the past, but if you're always longing for the good old days and how things used to be, then you might not be doing much good in the here and now. We can't go backwards, we can only go forwards. We can learn from the past, we can remember the past. But if you're always longing for how things used to be and longing for the good old days, you might be missing out on what God wants for you now. 
And I think we need to figure out what does God want for me today and what does he have for me tomorrow and how can I keep moving forward? Because if you have breath in your lungs still today, then I believe God still has purpose for your life. That we need to move forward, to press on, to chase after what God has for us. Philippians 3 says, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Keep moving forward. Keep living for Jesus today and, and living for Jesus tomorrow and looking to the future that he has for you. We don't need to long for the good old days. We can remember them. We can build upon them. We can trust God in the future because of what he's done in our past. But I believe we need to keep moving forward. All right, as I'm running out of time, let me, let me just say this. There's a lot of different little simple pieces of wisdom, and maybe there's one thing that you can, you can take home. Maybe there's two things that you need to work on. But I said at the beginning that this will not just make your life better. It'll make it more like God. It'll make it more like Jesus. And the thing is, that's our ultimate goal. How do we be more like Jesus? And when I look at this list, I know that Jesus had a good name. I mean, Jesus had a name above all names. His name, 2,000 years after he lived and died, is still changing people. The name of Jesus is a good name. Acts 4 says there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus had a good name. Jesus knew that everybody dies. Jesus actually came, and his whole mission was to die for us. Jesus came to die, and his death changed the world, and it saved the world. And he knew his death was coming, but he also knew his death was not the end, that he would come back to life. And because he did, we can also live even after dying. Jesus said himself, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. So yes, everyone dies, but those who have put their faith in Jesus believe that he came and he died and he rose again. And they invite Jesus to be the Lord of their life here and now. They follow after him. Those of us that are followers of Jesus, we will live even after dying. Jesus knows a thing or two about sadness or sorrow. I mean, I mean, Jesus knows what it feels like to be human. He gave up his life for the whole world, even those that were literally putting him on the cross to kill him. He understands what it's like to be betrayed and lied about, abandoned and mocked, to be beaten, to be killed. He understands sorrow. He suffered and something awesome came out of it. Something positive came from the suffering of Christ. Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was, he was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds, you and I have been healed. Jesus had a lot of people trying to tell him all the ways that he was doing things wrong. He had a lot of critique coming from people. He had a lot of people trying to tell him what he needed to do and how he was doing things wrong. But he came to carry out the will of the Father. He wasn't here to please people. He was here to please God and save people and love people. And he listened to the only wise being in his life, God the Father. Remember, he came and said, God, your will, not mine. That's what I came to do. Jesus was patient, patient, enduring so much on his way to the cross. He was slow to anger in the middle of very tense and trying situations. And Jesus is waiting and ready to come again in the future. He, he would say, keep moving forward. Keep looking towards eternity because one day I'm going to come back and I'm going to make all things new and I'm going to make all things right. And this is the future that we need to be moving towards. So if you want to be more like Jesus, if you want to be have a better life and be more godly, then you should take something from this whiteboard wisdom and take it home and allow it to motivate you or challenge you, whatever it needs. For all of these are ways that we follow after God and live a life that's more like Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for not only your example that, that Jesus, when he lived, he left us a perfect example of what it looked like to be God, a perfect example of how we can be more godly in our life, a perfect example of wisdom. But we also get these, these unique books throughout your scripture, like Ecclesiastes, that find unique ways to teach us wise lessons. Lessons that make us more like Jesus. Lessons that help us follow your way of life. Lessons that are wise for good living. So I, I pray that, that someone in the room or someone listening online, that, that we were able to take one or two or three of these that we can, we can take home, we put it in our hearts and put it in our minds that we can chew on so that we can spend every day striving our best to simply follow and be more like Jesus. It's my hope and prayer for my life, my hope and prayer for the lives of everyone listening. 
that we would be more like.